Kyrie. <laughs> I don't know. I was, trying to, I was trying to do research last night and I was like, I don't know. Nah. And I'm late already. Nah. Kyrie. Is that how you spell it? Let me check my Android. Kyrie. Kyrie. Nakiri. So, are you filming? Yeah. Uh, so, with this style of knife, the challenge, the challenge of this style of vegetable knife is there. It, it isn't like a traditional knife with like some rocker, or even low entry rocker. For me, like the Nakiri is like pretty dead flat. Uh, which is really challenging to forge dead flat and to pull a heel and make it evenly. And it, it, to me, it's one of the most challenging chef knives to brute to forge and make really, really, uh, really work. You can make one that looks like it, but it's, if there's a few examples, like for a few things, like with the Nakiri one, for me, the ones that I've studied, they're pretty much flat through here through here is flat and then there's a little roll up on the bump right here and a little roll up here but majority of them are, are pretty flat through here which is challenging and then I forge mine in regions so like this is one region and this is one region and this so it has to be this right here will be the thickest point and then from there, nothing straight. From here to here, it will distal taper. And then from here to here, we'll distal taper. We'll taper a cutting bevel and then this way to this way. That's how I forge this knife. Um, this area right here needs to be super thin. So we're gonna pull all of this down. This is one of the reasons why, but the Nakiri is like the dopest vegetable knife and it's designed for vegetables. And it's not designed for like cutting like this, it's straight down. Ta -ta 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 -ta. So it's a great knife, it's a very useful knife, it's a very practical knife and it's a great challenge to forge, especially brute to forge. If you just take a thin piece of steel, your grind would be from like here to here, here to here. But we're gonna try do all our geometry and just grind right here. So we're gonna try do everything that we would typically grind up into and forge it all with a hammer and then we're gonna just do this, grind this part, hopefully. <laughs> But um, you want this transition to be thick because this is your strength, this is your stability. And I like to make the tang at least lo as long as my hand. And so sometimes people will do this like baby fucking tang and, or I stop swearing in these videos, a baby tang. I like to put at least enough tang in there to, to cover my hand for where I'm grabbing the knife. And it's also, a, a great opportunity to balance the knife because a lot of time the wood is can be fairly light wood and epoxy can be fairly light so to get a good balance you can also mess with the tang by leaving it longer and at leaving more steel back in this transition to give the knife a better balance um, but yeah so I'm gonna forge this out of one inch uh, Hitachi round, it's 1085. Got it from a supplier that brought it in from Japan. So we're gonna try to go pretty traditional. Um, it's a dope knife, I love it. Hopefully we can crush it on this one, but it, it's a great example. I think it's gonna be something that, you know, I forged a few of them, so try and share whatever I've learned and the experiences that I had in dealing with them. And you know, I cook a lot and this is one of my favorite knives, so we'll go get it.
going all the way back, Hanabara days. <laughs> what? What is that Hanabara days? The fuck, you don't know what Hanabara days is. Where are you from? Huh? Where are you from? You're not from Hilo. I thought you was from Hilo. Hanabara days, bro. When you rub it, run, run with your locals with them to your fingers so you go more fast. <laughs> Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and then you can go take on bodyboard. Oh, cuz. <laughs> right? <laughs> the slipper is the ultimate. Makes you run faster. You can use it as a fucking, uh, fucking body surfing thing. <laughs> you got, I got beat my whole life by one rubber slipper. Well, that thing. You got, uh... What else you got? Only in Hilo they say Aikurish. I've never heard it anywhere else. It's like a, I think it's like a... Aikurish! Is it Filipino? I don't know. So this is my brand new anvil. Uh, it's almost 400 pounds. It's called the R French Rhino. It's the big brother to the, f the, the French pig. There's no step. So it's from like 18th century. Probably belongs in a museum, but it ended up here where I beat on it every day. And then the stand is a monkey pod stand that the boys grinded and made flat. And, and then we just glued it down. I, I got that tip from uh, uh, Michael Quisenberry. So I just glued it down and it don't make no noise. It's good. When you spend enough money and the anvil is heavy enough, it doesn't need to be bolted down, but it's so expensive. <laughs> it was so expensive. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's seven inches across. Uh, and it's, there's a, there's a weight ratio to hammer. I don't know the, the hammer weight to anvil. So like, if I'm going to use like a four pound hammer or close to a four pound hammer, you need enough anvil for it to really maximize your hammer's weight. So you know, more mass under you. This is a 200 pound, that's a hundred pound, you know, so just, and then this is a 60, 68 pound. But I really like this, this, I bought this from uh, Atlas Knife and Tool. I like it cause it don't make no noise. There's no horn. Or if you look at these bodies, like if you look at the bodies of these anvils, see how the hip swings in? So only here is the mass that you can actually forge on. So it's only this wide. And so that's actually technically bigger. This is all for like tooling options. But as a knife maker, I don't really use a lot of these things. I, I traditionally use center mass. So that's equivalent to like a hundred pound anvil but it just don't make no noise. Like, because it doesn't have the resi the sound can't resonate out this or this, this thing just sounds, it just has a nice, there's nothing to resonate out the top. So, I mean, dude, and I think this thing's like three, 400 bucks. It's a fucking good deal. It ain't this. But this is cat to come from France or whatever the f came from. Okay, bye bye.
And so for people that, for people that use a press, like a lot of times I see people that the, when they're making Damascus or using a press, they'll use these like rounding dies and it just, it just looks like this when they squeeze it. It's just, and they squeeze too much. What you really want to do is using a press to like, I use all square dies. I don't use round rounding dies. Um, and the reason for it is I use it almost like a power hammer where you work a step. So you step it down and then your next bite is really small and then it, and then it, it's very easy for the press to squeeze this amount of material and then it catches up with this, this, this thickness. And then you squeeze another bite, another bite, another bite, another bite, another bite, and you do a lot of small bites. And so what it does is it creates this double bite and it really makes your Damascus really even and it makes the material go this way and very evenly. So when like, so if I was using a rounding die, it just looks like this, like it just looks all crazy. And then the, when the bar itself looks like this, when you squeeze it in big chunks like that, and that's just your Damascus getting all fucked up and, and your pattern getting all fucked up. So I always use flat dies with just the radius broken off a little bit and I do small bites like that. And I even apply that to even just bringing down mono steel because you don't want it to look like this if you squeeze it, you want it to look pretty fairly consistent, you know? Press work, but doing small steps like that is crucial to keeping your pattern the same when you're building Damascus. See how consistent the material opened up. It's not all pushed out. So that's like a skill set of using your using your tools like a lot of people will just get their press and because the press can squeeze something, doesn't mean that you're not disrupting your pattern. Maybe you want to disrupt your pattern, but like, but like, I don't want to. I want to keep my pattern fairly easy, uh, consistent. And so having a, a stepping system of taking small bites is, is, is super important. And even when you're using a power hammer, it's the same thing when you're using a power hammer, if you just hit it all over the fucking place, you want to hit it so that it does its work and you take another small bite, another small bite, another small bite until it catches up with the rest. And then you can get a consistent reduction. What you can do is to, to isolate your tang, you can use a corner of an anvil like I've done in the last video, but I got this new snazzy tool. So I'm gonna use this tool today. I got this from the same guys that make my hammer. Uh, I gotta shim this, but uh, uh, John from Sunset Forge and CJ built these and it comes with a bunch of different variations. It's super dope. Huh? Uh, I'm pretty precise with the other the other tool, but um, I'm pretty precise with the other 
the other way too, but this is just nice. I mean, I like supporting guys that are making stuff for the knife maker community specifically. And so there's a lot of different options for this thing. It's great. So even from the very beginning, you gotta start keeping and working working this edge straight. So even before we do even anything else, you gotta keep working this edge straight and the same thickness. Okay. So we're gonna keep working that edge. Every time we forge it, we're gonna keep working that edge so that it doesn't get all too round or too rockerish. pretty much have the length that we want. So now we gotta pull down our width of our, of our, our blade. I like, whenever I'm forging a knife, I like to make just a smaller version because as I start making it thinner, so if I kind of forge it to the size that I want and then I start making it thin, then it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So I make a tiny version of the knife so that as I start thinning it, it becomes the actual size that I want. People that, people that say that they just kind of go where the steel wants, like, I mean, it, it's steel, you, you can make it do whatever you want, you know? And you notice that when I peen, I don't jump around. I don't hit all of the edge. I work it in one width of this hammer, one strip, then I'll do another strip, then I'll do another strip, another strip, and another strip. I don't hit it all over the place. A little bit, it, it, uh, I saw this in a, in a Japanese forging book, and it's basically like a bunch of little peens, but it kind of traps the steel so that then when you do hit it, it moves where you want it to go, you know what I mean? I don't think John was too stoked that I did that to his hammer. <laughs> but he said, it's my hammer, I can do what I want. So I did what I want. So now we're gonna fix that offset because I widened it, now we're gonna fix the offset to the tank. Back to correcting that cutting edge. Okay. And then because the top is uh, a little bit round, 
we're gonna work that. So now we're gonna forge the bevel side of it down and we're gonna pull it down. And if you watch as I'm hitting, I'm gonna be used like this one side of my hammer to almost forge it and peen it at the same time to kind of control where I want it to move down versus just moving everywhere. So you're gonna see I'm gonna be at like a slight angle pulling that heel down so that it doesn't just make it grow everywhere. We're gonna control the way it grows by just leaning the hammer one way. You don't have to worry because as you're forging the cutting edge, it's going to want to curve up. But we still have a lot to forge on the back end to put the distal in. So I cut the forging end first so that when I do the distal taper in the spine, it straightens it back out, you know? Because that part, it gets tricky as the knife gets thinner to keep straightening out. It just wants to crinkle. See how narrow we started out and how wide it gets when you start thinning it? That's why you gotta start out so narrow. There's so much material going to the cutting edge. So now if you see the route I took was here, almost like how we grind the knife. Then I came back this way to get it thinner. And really sometimes getting the edge thin is one thing, but it's what's right above that edge. And so that's where you really gotta get it thin to make sure it looks like that, you know? A lot of times it'd be full thickness and just curved in. If you really want to do like a really close brute to forge geometry, you got to act like the grinder. And so you got to hit, especially as high as you can on the area that it would be grinded. So now that you see this curve, how it's curved, now I'm going to forge the distal spine in and it will straighten it back out. So you see the curve? Now watch.
way less curve. Now it's just some fine adjustment, you know. Then we're gonna go back because I didn't take the edge down to full thinness yet because I still need to do some corrections. And I mean, the number one thing that people ask me is like, does it warp? How do you stop it from warping? It's gonna warp, it's thin. It will warp, some will warp less than others. Main thing is your consistency in forging is, is even, but it's gonna warp, so take out the warp. Like, get good at taking out warps. Like, I make swords, so you gotta be good at taking out warps. Like, if you're a little baby chef knife catches a warp, that ain't shit when it compared to like a 32 inch katana. Yeah, and it S warps, you better learn how to take out warps and so forging thin yeah that's part of it it's gonna warp probably you know but that's okay things I gotta address is how much I fucked up on the tang and I gotta make it smaller. <laughs> Whoops! Better to have too big of a tang than too small of a tang. I mean you're gonna have to straighten it. You are gonna have to straighten out the spine but kind of like bending it all one way and then straightening out and then forging it the other way and then straighten that out. Just know where your, school, your steel is going. I always have a game plan and a route to like I'm gonna forge this side because then this side will correct it and keep correcting it with the forging and then you just have some basic fine tunes to do on the knife, you know? One thing I will tell you, if you hot cut something, do not use your nice fucking hammer because then you just put a bunch of marks in your face from here and then it will translate to your hammer onto your knives. Damn, that's off a little bit. Okay, let's get this tang reforged out. That straight now. You know, the, the, the thing about it is like, it's like, as knife makers, I think a lot of knife makers are very curious people and want to kind of create a name for themselves. And I think a lot of them are looking to invent something new. And that's just not what I'm about. Like, I don't, I, I'm not in competition with any knife maker because it will never end. Like I'm, I'm a very mediocre knife maker. I mean, there are some guys out there that are so talented. I'll never be able to catch up with them. But what, what I am more focused on is just solely just kind of creating my own path, but preserving what is done 
what was done in history. I mean, why did they make chef knives like this forever? Like, obviously there's a reason, you know what I mean? And I'm always trying to find that reason in their techniques and their style and preserving the history of forging, you know what I mean? Instead of trying to come up with something new that no one's ever seen, because I'm not that smart. <laughs> You know, there's some smart ass dudes out there, you know. Fucking Mareko, like, Mareko is like, the, he never even went to college and watch him break down math. You blow your mind. I ain't that smart. Look, I couldn't even calculate how much steel I needed in my tank. <laughs> that guy could tell you the ounce that this knife should have been. And yeah, I mean, dude, you could take this knife and you could get a piece, a sheet of eighth inch steel, cut it out, forge the edge, f gravy, easy. But that's not really gonna teach you anything. And, and I don't judge anybody that does do that. Maybe they don't have a press. Maybe they don't have a power hammer, I don't, you know. I don't care, it's just for me, I'm into pre preserving like, the history and, and kind of studying more about what has happened before me than trying to advance to what's happening, what I can contribute to the future. Like I'm more of a old dog that's just too stubborn to change. So I'm gonna make sure I get basically where I would grind down. And then I'm gonna run this right on this edge so my hammer can hang off and I can really forge that cutting edge down. And then we'll do it to the other side. The fuck is a piece of paper, huh? No, it's thin, man. Like, I'm trying to forge as thin as I can. Light. I mean, I forged a knife recently that's brewed to forge and it's flexible. Like, that's thin. It just shows, show, goes to show how much I don't like grinding. No offense, combat abrasive. <laughs> but I hate grinding knives. And I love forging, so I might as well take it to the limit. Okay, we're gonna do the other side now. Same thing. Catch that upper section. And then I'm gonna hang it off the edge. Then staying nice and straight, though. Huh? So one of the most important parts in the nakiri is the first one third of the knife. So when we're talking about this nakiri, all of this is important, but nothing as important as right here. It has to have pass through geometry. It has to be thinner than here. So it has to be able to go into that onion this way. Like, so if you're holding an onion, it has to be able to go into an onion like this. And if it's too thick, it's gonna wedge itself. So this needs to have the nutsest pass through geometry right here. So that's why if you were to grind it, you would grind it probably like this if you were, you know, like a wide base. But because we're forging it, I'm gonna put, it's gonna be one thickness here and it'll be one, it'll be a lot thinner there. 
I mean, the Nakirian itself has to have a lot of pass-through geometry, but most importantly, it's in the front. So you see how thin it is right here in the front? Let me straighten it. But do you see how it's like one thickness here and then it's slowly tapering out there? That's what we're looking for. And don't worry about straightening it every time. Just beat on it, beat on it, beat on it, beat on it, correct the profile. Then at the very end, you can kind of fine tune it, but people are always kind of like trying to worry about the way it's going. And I don't worry about it to the very end, you know? See, look at this here, I'll show you this. Look at how long I've been hitting and everyone's saying I'm hitting it cold, but look how red it is, you know? And so, and I mean, and that's after I held it out for a while. And so like, as you get forging, as you get closer to the final thinness, if you wanna take the dents out, you gotta hit it at a lower heat range. And you do, obviously you're not trying to f murder it, you're just planishing it, but you planish it at a lower heat range. And then you're also refining the grain structure because you're forging it, you're bringing it down at a lower and lower temperature, you know? And then sometimes I just shut the forge off too because it's getting too hot. I just turned it down. But you just don't wanna keep inflaming the grain structure as the knife gets thinner and thinner. What you're trying to do is refine it, reduce its size down. Ooh. That's thinner than some people grind their knives. <laughs> Wanna refine this tang a little bit. Just because like I started out from a one inch bar, I brought it down to an inch and a half stock by eight inches. You know what I mean? So you can go buy an inch and a half stock that's maybe a quarter inch or thinner and isolate your uh, your tang and then pull, pull your uh, width down, I mean, uh, you know, if you don't have a press, you can do all of that by hand. Like I use just the press just to get it down to a workable size. I like the option of just in case I want to do an integral or not, you know. As you're forging, you want to constantly be looking at your spine. You 
want to constantly be looking at your spine, spine's thickness. And it's nice to kind of like square up all your edges. So you see like, you know, it's tapering and then it's doing its thing, you know? Okay, so now before I go and straighten it all up, I'm gonna forge a choil area for uh, my handle so that I'm gonna do a little light uh, upsetting on the choil so it's really comfortable on my index finger as I use it. I am gonna snap it after I choil it. Should I show some sneaky tricks or what? Huh? Tricky tricks, boy. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Learn that one from Mareko Mamasi himself. Look at that. So the upset. So what was the whole reason for that? Because it's comfortable it's against your like finger. It. Yeah, if not, you're gonna work it and it's not gonna be consistent and it's gonna upset more when it's hot and then it's gonna upset less. So once you get it at one consistent heat, it upsets evenly and you just pick away at it and not try and fucking murder it. And I learned that from Reco and it's also annoying. Like you go back for it, back for it, back for it. And then it's like almost like hitting butter and then it stiffens up. And so you gotta kind of adjust. So doing it with a torch like that, really fucking gets it pretty even. And you can kind of clean it up this way. Stamp it. I, I guarantee you people are gonna, on that little trick, people are gonna go, ooh, and you're gonna see piles of them out on the internet afterwards. When Mareko showed me that shit, I was like, oh, fuck me, dude. 
Here's our link to Amazon. <laughs> Hey, just so you know, I'm going to have my own subscription on Instagram. And so you got to pay like hundred dollars to see exclusive content. <laughs> no, we're fucking giving this shit away for free. Fuck. I don't give a fuck. I mean, hey, I don't hate on anybody that's doing exclusive content, but... I'm not, I'm already appreciated that people just follow me. You know what I mean? Just follow the account and comment and do all that shit. I don't give a fuck about no prescription. Or what is it called? Subscription? Prescription? <laughs> Whatever, bro. No, but you know what I'm saying, right? Like, it's like, bro, we got 20,000 or whatever. 20,000. 20,000 followers or subscribers on our account. That's cherry, bro. Huh? Subscribe to my prescription. <laughs> my prescription to my subscription. I used to think it was such a downfall to be left eye dominant. It was always a problem in my life, but for forging, it's perfect. Like. <laughs> Imagine if I was right eye dominant, I'd have to be like this, but left eye dominant, perfect, bingo. Oh God. Did it look like it disappeared? Huh? It looked like it disappeared. Did I go cockeye? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so yeah, tan. It's <laughs> I gotta go like this and make the sound effects like this. <laughs> huh? Oh. Peekaboo! Can't see you. That's tin boy. So one thing about my forge is if you notice, uh, Peter Schwartzberg made this forge and it, it rolls. It's not bottom firing, shooting it directly, hitting the knife. It come hits the top and it rolls. And I have the ability to shut the back one off. Um, and so we got a thermometer in there and we're gonna range so that we can control the precise, uh, the precise temperature to quench. So we'll let this come up to temperature. 
So I got this little piece rebar to preheat my uh, my oil. You're always looking at about 120 degrees is what you want your oil to be. Let's see. <laughs> By the time it goes, it'll be cool. So the reason for the reason for heating your your steel the reason for heating your your oil is the colder the oil, the more it uh, it bubbles, I guess, and creates vapor. So the hotter it is, the thinner the oil, the less it boils around it, so the harder it will actually, it doesn't make any sense, but like the thinner the oil and the hotter the oil, the faster it will cool it and bring it to that temperature versus it trying to boil and come up to temperature, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, so especially when you're doing like, like you're trying to get a hamon, I mean in, that's why you want fast quetching oil is because of that particular reason, you know? So now I just kind of sit here and shut it on and off. Like if you have like a top firing uh, uh, forge, you might want to like put a pipe in there so it's not getting direct heat and constantly move it and out. But my forge is super even. Like it's almost the same temperature here, here, or here. And so I got the back one shut off so I don't burn off the thinner part of the knife. And now I just regulate the temperature. And I never let it get past hotter than 15, 25, 15, 35. Cause I want to lose about 10 degrees from here to there, you know? I think, I don't know. <laughs> That's just what sounds good. No, I don't know. So we're gonna bring it up to its temperature. And then we're gonna already thermal cycled it while we were forging it. And then after I already thermal cycled it and normalized the steel, but we're gonna do it one more time right now kind of make sure that I'm straight too And the problem is, is when people quench it, they lift it out and throws this cool flame ball for TV. But that's not what you really want is because when you quench it, you don't want it to catch on fire because you're just auto tempering the knife. You're just losing the hardness. So you want to keep it in there moving so it doesn't create a vapor jacket. And you want to leave it in there until it pulls itself down. So once it gets up to temp and the color is the same as the thermocoupler in there or thermal, the thermometer thing in that and the knife is the same color and I know that, you know, and the whole environment inside is at the right temperature and then we'll go ahead and quench it but I'm going to keep it stabilized at that temperature so it fully saturates all the way through the knife. This is the most critical part. Like when I see people like have top firing, top firing forges and they just leave them in there and their tips are all getting burnt off and stuff. Like I used to do that in the beginning, you know what I mean? And learning like 
this style of like, if, if you can't do it in the forge, do it in a kiln, you know what I mean? And Cause it's the most important part. I like doing it with fire cause I'm like, you know, you're, you're birthing this knife. You're like giving it life. It just went from useless steel to performance steel. So I like to do it with the forge, but, but it is the most critical part. I've done this over 700 times. Like, uh, you know, I have it, you know, pretty dialed. Like, but if you have to use the kiln, use the kiln, like whatever. Like, but this is the most part, uh, important part of the knife is giving it, turning it into performance, you know? So it's been saturating in there for a while, so I'm gonna let it, and the temperature is pretty stable. So I'm gonna let it ramp up a little bit. Check if it's straight. No flames, no fire. Oof. Oof. That one came out straight as shit. Well. Pretty straight. I got a bend in the tang, but shit, that's easy. Don't mind my ghetto ass sink. <laughs> Bro, this comes from the rain. I washing them with rain water. That's the secret. No. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm off grid, so. This is how we get our water is right here. You know, got a little electric pump. So I always tell people too, man, like don't, don't harden your knives and Don't harden your knives and then sit around and don't like, it's best to go straight from hardening it straight into temper it. Don't harden it, let it sit there forever and then decide to throw it in there, you know? And so we're gonna run two cycles, two cycles at two hours. Uh, and then, and then go from there and then we'll grind it and put a handle on it and hand sand it and put it all together. I won, I actually won this Paragon when I won Forge and Fire. They gave, so back, back when Forge and Fire, I think it was, I was like the last one, I think season four, they were giving every winner a Paragon kiln. It was pretty cool of them as a company. So if you won, uh, Forge and Fire, they, they gave you the 10 grand or whatever you win plus this. So I got this and then I didn't know how to use this stupid programmer. So it sat here for like two years and then I finally figured out how to use it. Now I use it all the time, it's great. I think like that's the kind of stuff people wanna know, you know, like little weird things like that, you know. I think doing this whole like I always tell people like, even if I go, like I've made so many knives and I've worked with some of the best people, but sometimes I just go to other people's shop and I see a little thing that they do and I'm like, damn it, I never thought about that. And there's always something to learn. So I think that's gonna be the benefit of doing a video like this, start to finish. 
So we're going to do like little projects like this, like we're going to do the Nakiri and then we'll figure out what we're going to do next. I'm going to bring in some other makers to finish some other things, you know, I mean, it'll be cool and I, I, I think people can take a lot and learn from it. I mean, opposite from like, um, like Instagram is super short, you see like a little clip, oh cool, like for short attention span and then with this, you'll see the whole process. It's gonna be long, but I mean, at least you can see little details. And then, um, you know, just so that it furthers the craft. And it also just, even for people that are just interested in the thing, they can see how much work and where it comes from and where it starts from. And, and it'll just be a cool little insight into the day in the life of a knife maker, bladesmith. People always laugh because my business name is T. Kami Mora Blacksmith. They're like, you're not a fucking blacksmith. Like black, I don't know if you noticed, but like blacksmiths really don't like knife makers. I don't know why. It's kind of a thing like, like I don't know why. Like every time it's like, and if a blacksmith makes a knife, all the other blacksmiths are like, oh, I mean, it's just like hardcore. I mean, blacksmiths are amazing. Like when you see like, I always, when I see a blacksmith forge a set of tongs, I'm always like, what the fuck? I'm like get super confused and I've forged tongs before and it's I'm like too like not right in the head to like keep keep it right in my head but um both people are amazingly talented but they always ask me why my business is Tikami Mora Blacksmith and maybe one day we'll do a whole post on the history of my great-grandfather was a famous blacksmith in Hilo in Hawaii and we'll go into that you know a little bit more and a lot of people don't know, like I have a T in my knife and they always don't understand why the T. My Japanese name is Teiji after the blacksmith. And so my business is T. Kamimura Blacksmith. It was established in like 1932. And so people, people don't understand what the T is. Now, now you know what the T is. It stands for my Japanese name, Teiji. And, um, and where the history comes from and why my name is T. Kamimura Blacksmith when I don't do any blacksmith. <laughs> I mean, knife making is technically blacksmithing, but it's not the same. <laughs>